Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out to um, come visit with us this afternoon. We're really excited about this web series. Um, for those of you that were able to come to our most recent JDAI conference in Seattle, um, this was one of the workshops that was a bang, and it was really powerful, and we have some dynamic speakers that are presenting to you today, so we wanted to bring you this today, um, an extra opportunity to hear. For those of you that weren't there, here it is, um, and we're going to do a part two on Monday, as Megan um, stated, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into what we're discussing today. So with that, thank you. Welcome from the foundation, and uh, let, we can get it started. Dr. Cookus. Okay, thanks Opal. Hope everyone is doing awesome today. I'm so glad you joined us. Uh, a couple things, I do talk a lot. So uh, they only kept me to like three or five minutes. So I'm really gonna try to keep to that time frame today. But I really wanna get to our panelists and I do wanna talk a little bit about diversion and what uh, any e. uh vision, what their vision is, what our vision is uh, specifically for diversion. I'm, and I'm gonna get into that after I introduce our panelists. Um, we do have three panelists today, and I, I put together some um, bios for each of them. Uh, our, our first panelist is Kevin Bethel. Uh, Kevin, uh, most recently, he was appointed the Special Advisor and Chief of School Safety for the School District of Philadelphia. He is a retired Deputy Police Commissioner in the Philadelphia Police Department, the fourth largest in the country. Throughout his career, Kevin has done extensive work in the juvenile justice field, most notably the development of a school diversion program within the Philadelphia school system that he's gonna be talking about today. Uh, on the personal side, I wish I would have known Kevin when I was a juvenile probation officer back in Pennsylvania. His motivation and ability to reach others is exceptional. He is a true leader and Kevin gets it. He really does, he gets it. He understands how important it is to divert kids away from the system. Our next panelist is Jessica Ellis. Jessica serves as the Executive Director of Sentinella Youth Services and the Everyday Restorative Justice Center in Los Angeles, California. Her organization strives to end the school to prison pipeline and the over-incarceration of youth. Jessica has 26 years of experience in youth development, education, nonprofit management, and restorative justice. She has received awards for her visionary leadership in building the second largest restorative justice program in the country. She is driven to ensure that victims and families touched by the justice system involve reconciliation and healing human connections. On a personal side, I met Jessica and her staff last January at Sentinella Youth Services in Los Angeles. It was really a profound moment for me in my career because I witnessed firsthand how youth diverted from the system, and I mean truly diverted, with no strings attached to the formal system really and truly works. I also heard from the leadership at the Los Angeles Police Department, that's the LAPD, how important it was to divert kids and not arrest and refer to the system. I learned later during my visit that Jessica and her staff had a role in shifting the policies of the LAPD to divert kids and use restorative justice as a replacement to arrest and referral. And last but not least, our third presenter, Dr. Bernard Williams. Dr. Bernard Williams is currently the Chief Probation Officer and Administrator of the Juvenile Court of Memphis and Shelby County. Bernard is a native Memphis of Memphis, Tennessee. He has worked in residential treatment, community mental health organizations, mentoring programs, and schools. He has worked on various committees and programs, including the Trauma Workforce, Workforce Group, local and statewide DMC Task Force, and served as the Racial and Ethnic Disparities Committee's chair. He, has also, served, he also serves as a deacon and minister at his church, and he has his PhD in psychology. On the personal side, I've only known Dr. Williams for the last several months, but I can tell you that his passion, energy, and commitment to youth and improving the juvenile justice system is overflowing. I immediately connected with Bernard, and I'm sure you will too. And oh yeah, I should also mention he was, and probably still is, a heck of a baseball player 
And let's just say he had an opportunity to play professionally, but des- decided to devote his talent and energy to improving the justice system. So that, those are our panelists for this afternoon. And what I'd like to do is give a brief, but kind of thorough um, <clears throat> review of diversion and what we're gonna talk about today. So for those of you that are looking at the slide, I guess that's everyone that's on the screen. If you haven't had a chance yet to download the Transforming Juvenile Probation, A Vision for Getting It Right document, the white paper on the Annie E. Casey Foundation's website, please do that. Uh, Within that document, to boil it down to two things, what we really are gonna talk about is diversion. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide, it does say two key pillars. And the first pillar is reduce the number of youth on probation by diverting a greater share from the system. That's primarily what we're gonna be talking about today. It's the pre-adjudication diversion piece that each of our panelists are experts in and will be telling us a lot more in their passion and how they're working with kids on the pre-adjudication side. And then the other pillar is really that we won't be talking about today, but we will have other information available, if not in the white paper, but online, uh, to refashion probation into a more strategic and effective intervention for the smaller number of youth who remain on probation caseloads. Excuse me, caseloads. Can you advance the slide, please? So um, a couple things. Why are we talking about pre-adjudication diversion? Um, As you can see at the top of your slide, increased and appropriate use of diversion would move hundreds of thousands of youth away from system involvement. And why are we so interested in diversion? Because we know that kids who are not diverted end up on probation. And it could be, and oftentimes is, a gateway to placement. And that perpetuates a lot of the racial disparities that we see and the overrepresentation of minority youth that are on probation and end up in placement. So there are a number of things when we talk about diversion in the white paper that um, are specific to diversion. And there's three particular points that I carved out today, just for the sake of the time that we have, that Kevin, Jessica, and Dr. Williams will be talking about. And that's to divert all low-level offenses and youth who are at lower risk for rearrest including all misdemeanor offenses and first-time nonviolent felonies. We wanna talk about community-led diversion. That is shifting responsibility for diversion services to community-based programs or non-court government agencies. So the courts aren't involved with those community-based programs. And um, I know our panelists will be talking about those today. And then last, no court consequences or refiling or refiling in court for non-compliance with diversion. If kids mess up in diversion, we don't want to automatically refile and repetition those kids to juvenile court and refer them to juvenile court. So that was the highlighted and brief version of diversion, specifically the pre-adjudication side. What I'd like to do is turn over the mic to uh, Kevin Bethel. Kevin. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cook, and thank you for the, the kind words. You can change the slide. Next slide. And so, so you know, with, with what Dr. Cook has talked about really captures uh, the work that I have. As you heard in my introduction and in my bio, uh, I was a deputy commissioner in the Philadelphia Police Department. I oversaw the patrol operations for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, in early 2011, I really get exposed to to, to uh, adolescent development and being in part of a program that brought law enforcement leaders across the nation uh, to have a conversation about how we could do things differently with our youth. Um, didn't know much about what that would look like at the time, and I often tell folks I went to a number of different programs and, and listened to uh, individuals talking about trauma, adolescent development. Uh, it wasn't until 2013 and going into 2014 when the light bulb finally went on for me. You know, as a deputy commissioner for 30 years, I've been locking up a whole array of folks, and particularly youth. Uh, Hi, but I would also- Tina Jefferson I'm calling from the Center of Office. I wanted to call on behalf of Maureen Eccleston to confirm that you will be attending. Hello? We You're can hear on. you, Kevin. I got, did you get that? I got some cutting. I apologize. Something, something broke into line here. Um, and so I, I would come to understand that I could do things differently. 
Um, I work with an amazing uh, Judge Stephen Chesty out of Clinton County, who really talked about how I could be doing something different uh, in Philadelphia and, and really focused me on the school to prison pipeline. And I often tell, I, I, I came back and I pulled this data, and I'm locking 1,600 kids a year in the city of Philadelphia for low-level offenses coming into the, into the schools. And we were locking up kids who were trespassing, who were coming back to school the next day uh, for trespassing. And so I remember looking down on that sheet frustrated and making the decision that we have to do something and to create what I consider pre diversion program that did not put the youth into the system, that did not have them saddled with the consequences uh, that Dr. Cook has talked about. So let's walk through what that looked like. Uh, next slide. Kevin, if you can get a little bit closer, it's a little hard to hear you. Um, I'm using the phone. Can you hear me now? I'll hold it up a little bit further. That's um, better. Okay. And so I have the, uh, you know, Philadelphia is the eighth largest uh, school district in the nation, uh, 218 schools. Actually, we have about another 60 charter schools, 134,000 uh, students, but another 50 to 60,000 in our charter schools. Uh, hit the slide again. Uh, we have, next slide. Uh, we have about 320 sworn on, uh, officers who work in the school or not sworn. So we have uh, school safety officers in our schools. We have another 84 sworn. So we have a large workforce uh, managing the, the school behavior in the schools. Uh, next slide. And so, uh, next slide. So you can you can click all the way through the, 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 the different elements in this slide. So, so just to give you an overview of the, of the school district itself, uh, as they indicated, 134,000 students, you know, 1,600 kids are, are being arrested every year. Um, you see the demographics of the school. Our, our school is predominantly African-American, Latino. 51% uh, is African-American. Uh, but if you hit the slide again, um, you'll, see, uh, you'll see that 80% of the youth come back. Well, 80% of the youth being arrested are, are African-American. So clearly we had an issue around disparities as well. Because even though our system is largely African-American, Latino, a disproportionate number of those kids being arrested are African American. And so we set forth a process, next slide, uh, with the understanding that, that these were some of the key things that were going to guide our understanding. As I became more uh, trauma informed and understanding that it was no longer the issue of us just arresting the child, it was the fact of what was the trauma inflicted on the child just by placing them in cuffs and bringing them into our headquarters. What was the impact that was going to have on that child as well? I mean, we are talking about 10-year-old children, the minimum age for arrest in Pennsylvania is 10 years of age. So can you imagine, at 10 years of age, we would take a child who came into school with a pair of scissors, uh, arrest that child, uh, take her and him, her into custody, or him or her into custody, uh, fingerprint her, photograph them, and hold them in a cell block for six hours, just for the next day to somebody trying to look at us and say, well, why did you arrest this kid? It was absolutely unacceptable that we were submitting kids to that kind of trauma and understanding also the things that would infect them. As you see on the screen, separation, many of our kids, a large percentage of my kids come from single parent homes. A large of them live in some of the most violent neighborhoods in, in America. Uh, and so that comes into our schools. Many of them are physical abuse and, and, and sexual abuse. And, and we're finding all of that now that we're doing our diversion work. In the past, we just kind of brushed across that and, and really didn't pay any attention to what our impact the rest was having on a child who was traumatized and not answering those questions as to what happened to you and not why did you do it. And next slide. And, and so uh, part of our process was to really create a, a, a collaboration. And, and, and I'm very, uh, so I don't mean to be arrogant in this conversation, but a part of this process was I really wasn't really asking anyone's permission to diversion. I walked in Commissioner Ramsey, as a police commissioner at the time. I told him, I said, Commissioner, I can't, as a person who's born and raised in the city, came out of the public school system, could no longer arrest these children in our system. He told me, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do a pre-arrest diversion program. When I walked out that door, ladies and gentlemen, I already knew that the numbers were going to drop. Uh, and so part of my process of creating a collaboration is I needed help getting it done. And so what you'll see, I, I reached out to the school district, Dr. Height, who I'm blessed to work for now, uh, and said, I want to do this diversion program. I'm going to divert the kids coming out of the program. And he was obviously excited about that because they were changing the code of conduct within their schools. And working with a family court, uh, fortunately, in the county of Philadelphia, I had one administrative judge who can kind of give me uh, the go-ahead. So 
But more importantly, uh, he was very, at the time, uh, the judge was very supportive of the work I was doing. Uh, the DA's office playing a critical role because one of the things I would recognize was re-empowering my men and women to make the decisions that giving up their freedom and taking somebody's freedom away was a very awesome power. And so we should not be abdicating that authority to anyone. And so the DA's office would convince, tell me that, listen, if you don't arrest them, I don't have them. And so that was a big part of this process because we had kind of created this cover ourselves and we're going to give everything to DA's office and what they did would re-empower us. And so as you go around the board, the public defender was a big supporter of mine because they would tell me things in the system that I was not aware of because at this point I'm educating myself. Uh, the juvenile detention alternative initiative was a home run for me because as I was doing my work and I could walk into the JDI collaborative, I had thought leaders who were at the leadership of their organization. And so when I made the decision I needed to do this diversion, the, the JDAI and DHS who, who provide the program services from all of our, our youth, the juvenile justice system in Philadelphia, and well, we have programs that the judge can kids to, you can have access to those programs without going to the court system. And, and that would take me to a DH Department of Human Services would be my number one partner in really in, in putting services in place to help us. And I saw and finished with Drexel University because I also realized that I needed to have it researched because I wanted to know what I was doing uh, was the proper thing to do and whether we were doing it effectively. Next slide. And so you can click all of them through. So this, what does the process look like? In, in the early part of the process, as you see, it was an incident that occurred in the school. Uh, we would make the arrest. That was it. Uh, we would move in a different direction and, and decide what offenses we would no longer arrest for kids in school. Um, so we made, we would create a list from the Philadelphia Police Department, working with our collaboration, but really police-led. Uh, and so we would take pretty much all the summaries and misdemeanor offenses and divert them. If a serious offense, uh, we don't divert those. If a youth had a prior offense, we don't divert those. But we felt comfortable with our data that very few of my kids had been arrested before. Uh, what the officer does when he arrives at the school, uh, he calls from the school and he, he calls into our intake center. We have two officers who actually work in DHS. We give them the information about what the child would be arrested for. If it's a divertible offense, they're directed to divert that youth. The youth does not leave school. He's not handcuffed. He's not fingerprinted. He's not photographed. He's not given any criminal record or any criminal paperwork. We divert that youth directly to programs without involving the system at all. Uh, one of the key components of our program is we have, we, I asked, and, and Department of Human Services provides the social worker to go home and do a, go to the house to do a home visit. And there, that home visit, they're able to get to some of the underlying issues that oftentimes get ignored. And for all of those on the phone, I'm sure you, you recognize what those are. You know, the levels of poverty in our city are high. No food, no gas, no electric, uh, other siblings in need of her. And so we, we move them into the program. That creates our diversion process. As Dr. Cook just earlier said, we do not come back and rearrest the child if he doesn't complete our program. But if my data supporter was on the, on the, on the, on the call right now or on the uh, webinar, he would tell you those kids are just doing just as well as the ones we put in the program. Next slide. And so what do those components of, of the program entail? A program is a six community-based program based on the zip code of where the child lives, not where they go to school. So they don't have to travel across the city to get to their provider. They go to a community-based program near their zip code. Uh, we have six of them. These are the core elements. As you see outlined, uh, academic support is big. Many of our kids, are, some of our kids have never had anyone tell them they love them or give them and touch them and hold them in a way and say things to them in a way to support them. Uh, we do a lot of work around engaging with the parents. Many of the kids are struggling with parents uh, because they're single parent homes. Um, and so part of this program is really not, I can't take them out of their community and the toxic stress they live in. And part of this program is really to try to build them the skills to be able to deal with all of the things that they see in their community and in their lives. It's not perfect, uh, but it is an opportunity to really try to build some skills for them to be able to, how do they put, where do they put their anger at? How do they deal with anger? How do they deal with the frustrations they deal on a daily basis? Next slide. And so the results are, as you see, uh, I brag about them. Uh, what happens when you make a policy decision? Everything you see here was a policy decision. Uh, we started with 1,600 kids being arrested. Um, uh, at, at the end of last school year, we had 456. This past school year, we actually were down to 250 kids. They were arrested, so we went from a system that used to be 1,600 kids to a system that did 250 kids. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? 
the world did not come to an end. You know, mm-hmm. as the school continues to function in an effective way, uh, and we're still be able to, and as you see the, in the lighter color, uh, we've already diverted uh, almost 20, 2,200 kids to services without involving the criminal justice system, without a criminal record, without putting them through collateral, the collateral consequences to go with that, and they're doing well. And next slide. And so, you know, and just to, to piggyback on that, you know, some thought that maybe the incidents in schools will go up because we're diverting, and this slide represents that the services, the, the, the incidents in schools have gone down uh, since we started. We've never uh, eclipsed the numbers we started with, so we're not getting kids who want to get diverted and taking their one shot at coming to school with a knife so they can get diverted. That's just not happening. Uh, next slide. One of the things that's exciting about the program is the results. As I indicated, uh, we are have a research partner, Drexel University, Dr. Naomi Goldstein, uh, and we're tracking our control group of the kids who were arrested prior to us starting the, starting the diversion program, which is at 27%. The kids that we're diverting are at 14%. Um, and, the, and the good part of that process as well, that none of those kids are getting arrested, right? So we did not arrest 1,600 in that group, and uh, it's a much smaller number. So we're very excited about the success we're having uh, with the diversion program <coughs> and that making kids recidivate and, and continue to come through the system. And, and next slide. And so I end my presentation with, uh, with, with, with my good friend Malik here uh, because he really represents uh, why the diversion work is so important. You know, I didn't want to get put away. You can't come back after that. You've got a record. People will look at you differently. The preschool diversion program, the council had it awesome. They wanted to see us succeed. And, and that's, he really, in his quote, captured everything that I was trying to do uh, in our program is really give these young men and women a second chance to be able to go on and thrive and, and do well. And Malik is doing phenomenally well because he graduated from high school. He's working a couple of jobs. He wanted to go to college. But the beauty of Malik is he's got a high school degree. He does not have a rest record, and so he's going to go on to do so many, many things. So I appreciate the time, and, and I'll, I'll pass this back over to Dr. Cook. All right. Thank you, Kevin. And I'd like to move right into Jessica Ellis's presentation, please. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, next slide, please. So I'm with Sentinelli Youth Services and the Every Child Restorative Justice Center, and um, our little community-based agency has been doing um, community-based diversion in Los Angeles County for over 45 years. Um, And we have a extensive volunteer network, which I'll talk about, which really, uh, we have the ability to put justice back in the hands of the community. And we've been a leader in restorative justice for over 30 years. Um, And we've been focusing on diversion Uh, most recently at the pre-booking level. So the arrest is put on hold. There's no booking number. The kid is not logged in the statewide database of arrests. And when they complete our program, they can legally say they were not arrested. Next slide. Um, So the restorative justice piece I'll focus on in particular is really in alignment with the teen brain and how the teen brain operates. Um, We have found that well, in our restorative justice program, we give kids the opportunity, it's not required, but they have an optional opportunity to meet with the victim of their crime to find a way to make things right. Um, and if the victim doesn't want to participate, um, then we give the victim the option that we have community volunteers who can sit in on their behalf and represent how that kind of behavior or crime impacts the community. Um, so the kids may meet with the actual victim or a surrogate victim community representative. Um, And in that process, the um, child speaks for themselves, a lawyer and a parent do not speak for them, and they talk about what happened that day. And then the the victim of the impacted party talks about how it impacted them. And and then the kid gets an opportunity to offer up some way to make things right. And uh, then the harmed party can agree if that feels adequate or not, if they want to add something to that or take some, you know, make it less, however they, it's their agreement. That meeting is facilitated by two volunteers from the community who go through our intensive training on how to mediate that agreement. And the agreement is completely up to the child and the harmed party. Nobody else is in charge of their agreement and what it will take for it to be right with them. 
what we found, those agreements can incorporate anything from uh, paying back money to doing community service. Often victims will ask kids to bring up their grades or um, you know, go, make sure they're going to school. It can involve lots of other creative solutions as well. And we found that, for example, with community service, when we ask kids going through that process or going through um, probation or court-ordered community service, and we ask them, well, why do you have to do this? They kind of roll their eyes and say something to the effect of, well, the man made me do it. They're really disconnected from the purpose and the reason for it. Um, but when we ask kids who've gone through this process why they're doing it, they'll say, well, I, you know, I ruined Mr. Johnson's store and I need to make it right to him. You know, and they've made a personal connection and they're building empathy to the impact of their actions. So even though the end result of doing community service may look the same, the way they got there makes a huge different impact on the kid and their uh, completion of it. So our kids going through this process have much higher completion rates than when restitution is court or uh, court or probation ordered. And this program has been um, recognized as evidence-based. Can advance the slide? Um, so we have multiple off ramps in our program for diversion. Uh, we divert at many points in the justice system, but I'm just going to talk right now about pre-booking diversion. And in our pre-booking diversion, when diversion in general, we define that as interrupting the next legal step the case would have normally taken. Um, so we don't want to be... Um, we want to be very cautious about net widening. So something that would have been a counsel and release should not go to diversion. It's only if that kid otherwise would have been arrested um, or otherwise would have gone to court. Um, so we consider things like status offenses or the you know incorrigible situations as something that can go to our services, but not under the diversion umbrella. So we have two channels of services needed just meaning there's no, um, no consequences whatsoever if the kid doesn't follow through. Um, and that would be um, for those lesser things that wouldn't have led to an arrest in the first place. So diversion for us is specifically for misdemeanors and felonies. Next slide. And we take a full range of misdemeanors and felonies um, with the exception of what in California are called 707B offenses, which would be rape, murder, kidnapping, um, but we do take otherwise the full range of misdemeanors and felonies. So kids can go through our program even up to a third offense. Um, so it doesn't have to be a, f a first offense only, first, second, or third offense. Um, and we do even felonies including home burglary. Um, or we uh, can also divert instances of assault that involved injuries. Um, so it's really been quite a wide range, and we've shown a lot of yes, impact from that. Yes. Jessica, this is Opal. Um, just a point of clarification. So you take up to third offense. Um, is that does that also include felonies, or is that only third time misdemeanors? How does how is that working? Yeah, our our exception to um, felony would be uh, we can take a third offense in general, um, even if it is a felony, as long as there was no prior felony conviction, or in California called a sustained petition. Um, and when we say a third offense, we're meaning, assuming this kid has not had um, our services before, so this is their first time getting meaningful diversion and meaningful intervention. Um, uh, but there are some exceptions where they can go through our program more than once, and we have agreements with law enforcement. We work on that together to decide that together if, if it makes sense for the kid to go through the program again. Um, and our program is all voluntary. Uh, the kid and the parent must agree. However, we have special protections for kids in foster care. We were finding that some guardians were denying it because they didn't want to deal with it. Um, so we get uh, social services to make sure the kid can go through diversion and that they're not divert, um, uh, prevented from that opportunity. And there's no formal legal admission on record uh, as to the crime. However, the kid with us does need to be willing to be accountable for it, but it's not formally on record. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, another piece that's really important to us is um, age, priors, 
crime type, th those are the referral criteria, the, their age, their priors, their crime type. Um, and it, this is an important equity watch opportunity. Um, we, with our law enforcement partners, they're really scaling back discretion of officers. And they are mandating that if it fits age, prior crime type criteria, then the kids should be diverted regardless of attitude. And that's really important. So regardless of attitude and regardless, um, we're even starting to move into regardless of resisting arrest. Um, we have found that the child's attitude with law enforcement is not at all an accurate predictor of how they'll do in diversion. And that can often, often if their attitude is being taken into consideration, that can also aggravate uh, racial disparities and who gets diverted. Um, so in our program, we have sort of tier one and tier two distinctions. So when they're referred to us, we do a needs and risk assessment. If the kid is low risk for recidivism, um, then they're just going to go through tier one services, which is primarily restorative justice, make things right, they're done, they can move on. Um, and if they need some connections to a few other supportive services, we do that service navigation. If they're at high risk for recidivism or have high needs and a lot going on, we put them into our full clinical case management supportive services. And um, next slide, I'll go into that. Uh, so this is the range of the types of services that we look to. We do a full needs and risk assessment. If, if on the mini assessment, and we're using the YLS BMI right now, if on the mini assessment we're seeing moderate to high risk, then a case manager will meet with the family in their home or in the community and do a full hour-long needs and risk assessment and look at what all the needs are. And then we do individualized treatment plans conducted constructed with the family engagement through motivational interviewing to uh, figure out what's needed. Uh, in addition to the YLS, if, we, if there's a sexual battery offense and sexual offending, then we use a variation of JSOAP. Um, and we're also right now exploring more strength-based assessments as well. Jessica? Um, yes. We have a, a question. The question is, are your risk assessment validated tools? Are they validated? Yeah, um, YLS CMI um, is one of the validated tools that's on the market. Uh, the JSOAP as well, um, which is uh, used around sexual offending. Um, so yes. And also, um, could you give us clarification on how y'all define recidivism? We so. Um, we use it only in the context of judging our program as opposed to judging the child. So when we're judging our program, we use a very strict definition to judge our own success or effectiveness. So we do look at if there's a new arrest within one year of the young person completing our services. Um, that's also because that's how our probation department is looking at it. So we can compare apples to apples. Um, with our, kids, they are, um, this diversion does not go on their record. So if they offend again later with a new offense that ends up in the justice system, the justice system is going to see it as a first offense because they're not going to have a record of this initial diversion. Um, so that kid has a cleaner slate to start from on that new offense. But we have found that our program reduces recidivism significantly compared to kids being adjudicated or put on probation. So this has been much more effective and they're more likely to stay out of trouble in the future. Um, in terms of de degrees of supervision, um, with our higher, higher risk, higher needs kids, we have a case manager that goes, does home and school visits uh, two to three times a month, depending on the risk level, maybe four times a month. Um, but there's no supervision from law enforcement or probation. So once they refer the case to us, they are very hands off and they have, we've earned their trust and they trust us to handle the case because we're, and we're community based. So I know that makes a lot of justice system partners nervous. Um, but we are mandated reporters. So if a child is being a threat to the community in any meaningful way, we do have to report that. Um, and if the, 
also as social workers, we don't believe in enabling. So if a kid is going to continue to do the same thing over and over again, then we will partner with the justice system to look at graduating um, to other solutions, other consequences um, for that impact. Uh, so sometimes we do work with our law enforcement partners to call the family and encourage their further participation or engagement um, in that way. Next slide. Um, we're part of a multi-agency collaborative, uh, very similar to what uh, Kevin described, so I'll skip that for now. Next slide for time. Uh, our data and outcomes are in here. Um, and so you can take a look at those later just in the interest of time. But also, this is hugely cost effective. It costs in our county about $9,000 to put a kid on probation. Um, and it costs $230,000 to lock a kid up for a year in LA County. Um, and our services for up to six months of services cost about $2,400. So big savings there as well. Next slide. And huge uh, victim satisfaction rate. And kids also report the process is fair. Um, this is a comparison of our recidivism data. Next slide. We're running out of time here. Oh, we're missing one. Um, the last thing is that uh, we do a lot of focus on equity. So we have a multi-agency collaborative um, that also includes um, children's rights advocates, and we do a lot of training for our justice system partners, law enforcement, school district partners, uh, to really reduce their reliance on arrest. Um, and uh, make sure that they're looking at their equity of who they're arresting and who's ending up in diversion. And so we review data for equity as well. And to answer the question I see, we, there's absolutely no charge to families ever for anything that we do. Um, and if we're sending them to a service that has a fee, then we're paying that fee. Um, uh, and we're not yet at the point of what you would call no fail diversion, but we're pretty close. So when kids have a service plan, um, you know, we expect them to complete the entire service plan and all of the elements in it. Though so it's completely customized to them and their needs and what's doable for them and their family in the first place, and they've really agreed to it. But if a child has completed at least 50% of their service plan and the reason they have not fully completed are factors outside of their control, like serious mental health issues, homelessness and displacement, then we can we have an agreement with our law enforcement partners that they are partially complete and those were factors outside of their control, then law enforcement will not complete the booking and the kid will still be considered uh, essentially complete with diversion. So it's really primarily only if the kid just completely fails and doesn't even make any effort, or if the um, kid picks up a new arrest, those are really the primary reasons that a child would fail in diversion and that we do not have high rates of that. That's it for me, thanks. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And let's move forward with Dr. Williams. All right, so we will be looking at some of the diversion, reimagine, exploring those app, untapped opportunities for restorative justice. Next slide, please. All right, so the, we're gonna look at reviewing the proactive diversion at the precinct level. So right now we currently have our probation officers or we call them juvenile services counselors who are at the precincts in Memphis. Memphis has nine precincts and right now we're moving, we have three of them in, in the, at the precinct level and we'll discuss that later. Uh, review the diversion for court involved youth and review the results of the programs. Next slide, please. All right, like the, the previous uh, presenters indicated, you can do nothing in my opinion without collaboration. Therefore, we have uh, Shelby County, uh, the Shelby County District Attorney's Office. That's a huge partner of ours. Of course, the leadership from that department, I mean, of that bureau, uh, our juvenile court of Memphis, Judge Dan Michael has a huge vision for diversion in the community. Um, and Memphis Police Department, in which most of our kids uh, are arrested, probably about 85% of our youth come from Memphis Police Department, inner city youth. Uh, we, we have other municipalities in the suburbs, but majority of the kids come from the inner city Memphis Police Department. Uh, 
Then we want to also look at, you know, talk about the common ground, neighborhood delinquency is better addressed at that community level, we're finding out instead of the kid being in formal court programming, such as probation, anchor monitors, and, and, and uh, all of those type of things that are court involved. Next slide, please. All right, so what are the pro proactive partnerships? Of course, a lot of what we're dealing with is we wanna solve those minor neighborhood problems before they get big. You know, the vandalisms, the, the criminal trespassing. We've, we saw through the years, I've been at this court going on nine years, a, a lot of youth were being transported from our schools for minor offenses, just as Kevin Bethel mentioned. A lot of our kids get kicked out of school if they return to school that were being transported to our detention facility. We were getting a, approximately about 900 youth being transported to our detention facility alone from the school system. That number has dropped drastically. Uh, right now, we, we only have a handful of those youth that are making it to our detention facility for those low offenses due to this type of programming. Um, of course, theft of property is a huge issue in our community as well. And then we want to, of course, improve that public safety. You all, and a lot of times we talk about the kids, the kids, the kids, but we also have to keep in mind that there's a victim that's involved as well. So with, with the precincts being in the community at the community level, it will allow for the victims to go to that counselor at the precinct. That's a juvenile court employee to make, make them aware. And at that point, they can intervene and also engage the churches, engage the schools and start putting some hands-on mentorship involved with that youth at the community level before offense is ever written by a police officer. And, and now you're also getting a lot of buy-in from, from police officers because now they're seeing youth that, that are being stopped and flagged down and they can communicate directly with that juvenile court employee at the precinct in their neighborhood and alleviate a lot of the small issues before they become big. Um, and, and that's what we're talking about, this early intervention and quicker access to those resources, resources instead of waiting to that youth come to, the ju come to the juvenile court and have those services available for them once they are arrested or placed in our detention facility. We want to go upstream to, of course, give a purpose-driven type of case management and be more connected with the community because we truly believe that the community has the answer for our youth. And building those positive relationships always with, with the community, the court, um, and law enforcement. When that, when you are constantly communicating, communication is always the key. You know, we're getting emails, they have our cell phone numbers uh, with community partners, and we can constantly check in real time to see how our youth are doing who are being referred to community agencies. Next slide, please. And the goals of the program of develop a efficient, effective response to unruly and delinquent behavior. Like we said, you know, a lot of times we wait and wait and wait, but with having people in the community, it allows us to interact with the community, such as, uh, like I said, the mentoring programs. We have a, a zip code based uh, resource directory in which everyone is given that uh, at the precinct that they need it, have any needs. Some of this stuff we all know is directly related to trauma and a lot of resources uh, such as utilities that may need to be paid that can drive behavior. We have a lot of transient families, families that are moving and moving and moving and moving and, and there's a lack of stability. And therefore, we can find those things out sooner and get the family connected to the resources that they need so that they can keep the lights on, so that they can have the necessary foods. And sometimes youth are not showing up to school simply because they don't have the clothes just the very basic needs. And then of course, we've, we're finding out that this is definitely reducing juvenile delinquency and enhance the quality of life for all of those who are involved at the community level. Next slide, please. And when what we're finding out, uh, we, we really target the, the areas that are having the most delinquency. Our old Allen precinct is in our Frazier community. And, and, and at the old Allen precinct, you can see this is how many families our, our juvenile services counselor has touched 637 families served in 2018 alone. I, I mean, there. Last time I checked, he didn't even have soles on the bottom of his shoes. That's how much he's running. And and then uh, you got the Tillman Station. Uh, you have 287 families, and now the program is growing. We're going to have a a precinct liaison that is going to be at our Mount Moriah precinct. And just to give you guys a ballpark idea, those precincts are servicing. I mean. Uh, 
according to what I sh the, the last Memphis Police Department, uh, the data that they showed, I believe it's 150,000 calls a year uh, at those at those precincts. We're talking about old out on the loan. That's, I think, according to my math, that's approximately about 19 calls a minute. Maybe some of you guys are better mathematicians than I am, but that is a lot of calls. And you, you really scale it back. Majority of those calls are coming after school, that Charlie and that Delta shift. Next slide, please. And now we want to start talking about once a child gets uh, that arrest report, or we call it a, like a civil citation, but we call it a summons here in Memphis. You can go to the next slide. So what we now do, even if a child does get that, we, we have a, a summons program. We realize that all of the youth who were coming in contact with law, law enforcement, number one, all of them didn't need to go to our detention facility. A criminal trespass, a theft of property, these low-level misdemeanor offenses, we wanted to make sure that even if they did make it to our court, that our court team, our management team, would have a screening uh, process where we review all juvenile summons. You go back to the next slide. I mean, go back, please. Right there. So we, we wanted to make sure that we reviewed all the summons, we read them, and the goal, of course, was to impact those first-time youth uh, and making sure that they didn't go deeper into the system. We also wanted to ensure that they were receiving the adequate services at, based upon their level. So the SRT, the Summers Review Team, we call it, uh, our Summers Review Program, Divert Misdemeanor Offenses, like I said, and those serious offenses, you know, dealing with uh, felonies, we, we always want to review those with our, our Shelby County District Attorney's Office and get some feedback. Go to the next slide, please. And I know this is kind of small. I don't know if a lot of you guys can see this, but this was huge for us with equal protection and, and making sure that youth of color were not being overrepresented in the system um, and going deeper into the system and having formal records. This program, these youth do not go in our formal juvenile court database. This is something that is strictly off the records. If you pull these youth that are showing here in this data, you will not see them in our system. So if the military called or if anybody called, you will find out that these youth were given an opportunity and, and really we do group sessions with them here at the court, our individual conferences with them, talk with them, get them connected with the resources by our, now they do come to our juvenile court and we host these sessions. We educate them, we empower them. And like I said, what we're finding out is about 78% of these youth are African-American. And that is a huge, that's having a huge impact on uh, the youth of color. Uh, we want to always keep racial and ethnic disparities in mind in, in everything that we do. And you can see that there's 1,349 youth that we've serviced. And, and what I really want to pat my team on the back for is the follow-up process, calling them, connecting them to services, but not only connecting them to the services, but, but you know, running the recidivism. How do we grade recidivism? Did you commit another offense one year removed? And, and we're grading it in a way, and now, in that way, and what we found is about 11% of the youth have recidivated. So think about that. 89% of these youth have no additional charges. So I would, I would say that that is a, a huge success and we're trying to get it to single digits as we continue to plan and implement uh, all the various things that we have going on in the community and continue to find resources. Next slide, please. Wow, looks like I have, uh, I beat the time for, I believe all the other presenters. I wanted to make sure that I got, you know, provided everyone with enough time to access the questions. Um, like I said, we have three precinct liaisons. We call them juvenile services counselors, uh, but they're at our precincts. We have three of them. I believe someone asked that question. And, and once again, thank you so much for listening to us. I will say in Memphis, the struggle is real um, and the, it's hard work. It's very hard work. You have to track it. The data is so important to keep track of everything that we do and, and the follow-up procedures are even more crucial. Thank you so much for, for listening to me and, and everyone else. Thanks. Dr. Williams, the other question that we have, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, who is part of your summons review team? What does that yes. team consist of? Yeah, that, that team consists of, I have a deputy administrator that 
that's involved in that team. And I have a manager and I have a supervisor that reviews all the summons that come into our juvenile court. Also, if a officer does decide to write a summons and they will give it to one of my precinct liaisons at their level, then at that point, they will also handle that, that case um, in a, in a non-judicial way, non-court involved way. Okay. Are the precinct liaisons court staff or law enforcement staff? So it sounds yeah. like they're both? Court staff, court staff. This court is court staff. staff. Yeah, court staff. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Bethel. Thank you, Dr. Cookus. We're going to open the floor up now um, for questions. So if you would, if you have any questions, um, you can type it into the um, chat box and we will uh, ask the panelists to answer that. Um, in the meantime, Dr. Um, Williams, you, you mentioned recidivism. So um, you said contact after a year of exiting the program. Does that mean arrest or does that mean adjudication? No, this is just simple. If th th does the child have a new charge, not adjudication? Okay. Does the, did the child pick up a new charge, period, from law okay. enforcement? Okay, great. Um, I think what the uh, audience may be wondering, um, especially for you, Jessica, I know you had a lot of stats on this, um, but how do your programs um, play into racial equity. So Jessica, you had some stats up with the um, results and I think you were at 98% was one of your outcomes. Do you know any, how that breaks down demographically? You're muted. I'm muted. Okay. Um, so our population of, first of all, the population that we serve, our kids are roughly about uh, 58, 60% Latino um, and about 38-ish percent um, African American and about one to two percent. The rest is kind of everybody else, um, white, Asian, etc. So. Um, and in our community, so there's already a disparity of who's ending up in law enforcement's hands right there because uh, African-American population in our area is not even 14%. So if we're seeing 40%, um, that's a major issue. Um, and, and we see that in even some blatantly concerning reports that we get. So we have a collection of um, either police reports or school discipline reports that have been sent to us where there was blatant discrimination involved. Um, and in that collection, 90% of those that we've collected were against African American kids. So it's a big part of our training and um, back to our partners and pushing back with them. So we have a whole team called our transformation team that uh, we built up about three, four years ago because we just saw so many concerning uh, even diversion referrals that we didn't think were appropriate that we have a team whose job is to basically advocate on behalf of those. So we'll go back to a police chief or up the chain of command and say, you know, let's talk about this police report. This is concerning to us. And so we've been able to get uh, reports dropped uh, completely, um, expulsions canceled completely through that advocacy work, and then we dovetail that into more training for that agency. So um, in terms of, we opened up all of our data to the Department of Public Health, who ran multiple data checks on all of our outcomes with our kids and families, and they looked at it by race, um, gender, crime type, and could find no disparities. We were having equal impact for kids, whether they were Latino, African American, regardless of gender, regardless of the charge. Um, so, and that's something that we continue to stay on top of um, and make sure that that's a big focus of our work. 
Great, thank you. We have a couple of more questions. Um, what did it take, this one is for Jessica. Well, let's, let's switch up a little bit. Dr. Bethel, is there, if there is no logging or criminal record, how are you able to track multiple contacts? Okay, so uh, I'm not a doctor, but that, I'll take it. Yeah, we're, yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are today. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what we did, we, we created a, a central database. So when a kid, a child is diverted, um, we, we created a standalone database. When they call into the intake center, the police officers log that into a computer. Um, and that is their first opportunity for diversion. But what we didn't want to do was influence their opportunity if they were going back and going to come into the a more formal formalized system. So if a youth is uh, arrested a second time when they call into the intake center, if that's not eligible for a second diversion, some of our cases, marijuana, disorderly conduct, have multiple you know levels that they don't go into the system at all. Uh, when that job goes to the DA's office and is arrested, they have a youth aid panel, and they would be able to get diverted without our program, our diversion impacting that. Great. Um, I'll throw this out. It says um, police can be the first interrupter to youth getting into the system. What specifics can you offer to encourage police departments to adopt the practice of diversion rather than arrest or detention? I'll take I'll take that one. Uh, um, I, I truly believe you got to have a, a collaboration. I don't know if that's we have monthly meetings we have of course daily meetings since we have people at the pro at the police precinct that that has i would call them um, multiple years of juvenile justice experience therefore they know how to handle those youth they are very educated on the processes at juvenile court therefore you got to have a you have to be integrate integrated in, into their their role i mean i would say integrated into their processes as well that way they will understand, you know, the stance of juvenile court and they have the necessary support. You know, I would say our juvenile court worker who, workers who are at the precinct, they are a, an additional support for the police officers. Therefore, they can call on this person at any time for questioning, for asking any type of questions or whatever resources that they may have that are specifically tailored to, to youth. And, and Opal, just real quickly, I, I think the, the key here is though is also being having being able to add that to their toolbox. Most police departments don't have the capacity to build a program like Jessica's and others, and so really need that support to be able to have something ready, kind of kind of plug and play, uh, where mm -hmm. the officer can be able to come in and make a different decision. Uh, but even, they need to have that kind of support. Our budgets don't can't satisfy it, and policing is really taught to arrest. So this is kind of a a mind change for many of them and so part of his training as well to get them to understand why this work is and educate them on why this work is so important yeah. that's exactly right thank you we have two minutes remaining i'm gonna turn it over to dr cookus to close us out dr cookus <laughs> okay i got the mute button off uh, i just want to <clears throat> want to thank everyone for participating today I know we're going to get a little bit more in depth in the next session on the 16th of December, which is, is that Monday, Opal? Yes, it's I have to Monday. Look at my calendar quickly. It's Monday. And um, one of the things, too, that I, I know we're going to be taking some additional questions and perhaps some of the questions that were posed that we didn't get to in the yeah. chat. But um, oftentimes, I know after we, um, we conducted this presentation in Seattle, uh, the question that we got was, well, or were, what are the next steps? Who should we begin talking to? If, if, yes. if our police, you know, I said it before, and we have such skilled presenters and panelists, um, you know, talking to the LAPD, and I mentioned it again, um, but when they said, you know, we, our, our mission is really to divert more kids than to arrest more kids, and that's how we um, evaluate officer promotions as well. That really stuck with me, and I think, um, knowing Kevin's expertise with law enforcement, uh, that's usually the first step, what, or, or could be one of the first steps, or the critical steps, because that's how kids are coming in the door. So what, what are the next steps 
that our jurisdictions, our sites out there can take to begin to have that discussion. So um, I guess we'll follow up on the 16th. And I just want yep. to thank everyone as well. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, especially to our panelists. All right. Thank you. Thank you.